When you start to take access to information, you start to take away access to conversation. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Rachel Vinman. I'm Amanda Weinstein. And you're listening to the Suburban Women Problem. So we're almost at 100 episodes. This is our last regular episode before next Monday's live event with Heather Cox Richardson. We are so excited for this event, and I know our listeners have been submitting questions to ask Heather. We can't wait to dive into everything with Heather live on Monday, May 15th at 8 p.m. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you only have a few more days, so be sure to visit the link in the show notes. Or if you have any questions, you can always email us at the SWP pod at redwine.blue. So Heather was our very first guest. And this week, I got a chance to catch up with Chastin Buttigieg, who was our second guest. It was so fun to talk to him again and share what we've been up to since he was on the pod two years ago. And before that, we'll be joined by Katie Paris to talk about Red Wine and Blue's response to the, quote, parents rights movement. They're launching a new initiative called Freedom to Parent 21st Century Kids, because that's what most parents actually want. But before we get to all that, what have we been seeing in the news and what's been in our group chat, y'all? Um, shootings? Again, it's like Groundhog Day over and over. It does feel like Groundhog Day, but in like the worst nightmarish way possible, right? Yeah. I'm just... I'm so done. And, and, you know, I, I know you're a legislator, Jasmine. I know your husband is a legislator, Amanda. I am tired. I am a mom. I am tired of people telling me what they cannot do in our house. The maximum effective range of an excuse is zero meters. (laughs) You will have consequences if you give me an excuse of why you didn't do something. And this is what I am saying to the president of the United States, President Biden, who I do support and have supported and will support in the coming election. Do something, lead from the front. We are done. We are absolutely done. And if you have a D next to your name, you need to go there and maybe you're not gonna get elected next time, but stand for something. Stand up and do something. All the, I think that the Biden administration has done amazing things on so many things. It doesn't really matter if my child is dead and they don't even have to be dead. Let's talk about if they're not safe right. to do normal things like go to school, go to a freaking mall. If we can't do those things, then we don't really have freedom. No, 100%. We don't have the freedom. And you can see that they can do it. They are choosing not to because we've seen them pass legislation anti-trans bills. We've seen them try and restrict access to the pills that we take. They absolutely can do something. This is a choice. Not doing something is a choice. And it is a choice that is leading to people dying. And you have people like uh, one of the first people that was on the scene, Stephen Spanauer. I might be saying his last thing wrong. But Stephen Spanauer, who is a former police officer, a former army officer, rushed to the scene in the mall in Allen, Texas. And he said, it wasn't mental health that killed these people. It was an automatic rifle. I'm a gun lover. I have guns. I'm a former police officer. I'm a former army officer. Prayers won't bring these people back. We need action in our legislatures. That's what Stephen Spanner said after he pulled off a mom who was dead off of her child. We are sick of having our kids be target practice for someone who got an you know, assault rifle. We're sick of being target practice as moms. There's no safety net. We are it on so many things in this country. And one of them is guns, right? We're the last safety net as teachers, as moms. If someone has a gun, you throw yourself in front of your kids. So hopefully they can live. We want a different way of life. That isn't freedom. Exactly. I was recently like, you know, scrolling through Facebook and one of my friends posted Uh, One of those like philosophical questions, like, which would you rather have a magic penny that doubles every day or would you want a million dollars right now? It's a it's a compound interest question. And I actually answered that question by saying, I know that mathematically the answer is supposed to be the magic penny. I get that. But 
the way things are going right now, I don't know that I feel safe enough to care about compound interest because I might not even see those days. Just give me my million now because honestly, I could step out of my door and go to Publix and never make it home. Or I can go to the mall and never make it home. We are all living in a moment in what is supposed to be a civilized society where any given moment could be the moment where you just happen to be in the place where some person who has way too much access to firearms and tactical gear and all these other things. And I'm like, why do we even sell that to people? Like, what do, what do you need that for? I It should be in the military. I know. And they want to say like, oh, this is, you know, this is their right. And they claim the second amendment. But the truth is, is you're not allowed to have nuclear weapons. Thank you. You're not allowed to have a tank. There's plenty of weapons you're not allowed to have because they are military grade weapons. Assault rifles are one of them. That should be a non-starter. The only reason these things exist is to kill people in large numbers. They're not hunting rifles and they are not used in self-defense. Weapons of war do not belong on our streets. No. And that's what they are. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I just want to point out, I am so tired. Every time there is a shooting, the automatic response is they're going to use this to take away your rights. Right. Right. The example that I always use is you need these rights and you need these weapons in case there's a civil war. Um, Last time I checked, there's only one side that wants a civil war and those are people with all the weapons. So we should actually be extra concerned because the people who don't want the civil war are, are the people who are advocating for like reasonable gun control. Just saying. Reasonable is the key word there. When someone says universal background checks, they're not taking your rights away. When someone says red flag laws, they're not taking your rights away. When we're saying that, you know, people who have shown themselves to be mentally incapable of doing other things in our society probably should not have access to multiple long rifles and handguns and tactical gear and helmets and all this stuff. Like that's not taking anyone's rights away. It's just common sense. Yes. I, I, I'm actually at the point of not understanding because even the Fox News poll shows that most people agree with this, even right wing people, except for the extremist. I'm actually not really understanding why we can't get something done because I feel like we're, we've, we've reached a point in our society where everyone agrees. This isn't cool. If you're not okay with a background check, you're not a good guy with a gun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I buy some of the good guy with a gun arguments. Then you're okay with the background check. All of the things, what you said, most people agree with. But the truth is, is we're not actually that polarized from each other. So this is something that Matt Desmond says who we're going to have on the podcast soon. We're not actually that polarized from each other. We're not. We're polarized from our legislators. Our legislators who do nothing, who refuse to act, That's who we're polarized from. And we're polarized from them for a lot of reasons. Gerrymandering, voter suppression laws, a whole bunch of things. We have become so polarized from our legislators who are failing to do anything on this issue that this is how we got to where we are. Yeah, I think that sometimes the GOP gets things wrong. And I think this is one of those things. (laughs) Just subtext, Jasmine, you must be in a good mood today. You know, I'm trying to be nice. I know. Uh, Sometimes they get things wrong. (laughs) And I think this is going to be one of those issues where they're listening to the extremists and they think that the people on Twitter are real and not actually bots that are just like paid to like, you know, put out in bad information. Mm-hmm. And I think just like the abortion issue, I think they're going to get this truly wrong. And I don't think this is going to bode well for them in upcoming elections. I really don't. Can I just add an asterisk to that though? Mm-hmm. We have to make it not bode well for them. hundred percent. We got to keep talking about it like abortion. Yeah. The actual way I think to make it is for Democrats to stand up and make them say no to it. Right. Over and over. Put Mm -hmm. the bills out there. Make them say no. Yes. Make them vote no. And I think the president should do something bold. I do. I do too. Like, I think when in charge, be in charge, dude. Leave from the front. All that. I mean, I know it's cliche. It's all the leadership 101 like stuff. But, you know, make a bold move. I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll make an analogy to my very favorite TV show survivor. Like (laughs) when you go and you're telling the jury why you should win the million dollars, 
when you are telling the people why you should be elected, tell me what your big move was. Right. Tell me what you did that. I mean, look, he's going to have my vote because he's not crazy, but um, (laughs) it's a low bar, (laughs) but like hold the center. Yes. Show people what you did, the big move that you did, not that you didn't do anything wrong, that you didn't rock the boat and don't hold the center that way. Hold the center by doing the big move. hundred percent. Look at what's going on every day. It is time for a big move. It is well past time. I like it. Like we are sick of seeing mothers dead on top of their children. We're sick of seeing the craziness, you know, of North Carolina passing the 12 week abortion ban. Like this is crazy and it's craziness after craziness after craziness. And we need people to make big, bold moves to put an end to it. And I mean, like, that's what moms do, right? If you can't handle a toy or you're hitting your brother or sister with it, guess what? It gets taken mm-hmm. away, yeah, right? We're that done. we know, like you have to handle this. You can't let stuff go like this. You have to address it right away. Or we're just going to keep seeing this type of stuff. Yeah. We do, we do need to talk about what they're doing wrong, but we also need to talk about what we want to do, what we are doing. Uh, in Georgia, we have several gun bills out there and they won't give them hearings. And so, you know what we do? We have press conferences about how we're not getting hearings. We all are signing on to a letter that's going to ask for a special session, but the governor has to call that. Uh, we can't call our own special session. He has to do it. So, you know, we we need to address this. And we need to address it now because it's dire. We have more mass shootings than days in the year at this point. 199. Like we've gone to war for far less. Yes, exactly. The fact that we just put up with this, we do not have to. It is taking a toll on our mental health. And that's another thing that now the Republicans really want to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. Sure they do. I mean, thank you for wanting to have that conversation now. Then let's have that conversation. Let's have a conversation about your record on supporting mental health. And the Affordable Care Act. They exactly. Don't. No, it's ridiculous. Not not to be too personal about like my my family situation, but you know, we moved and and I have a 12-year-old. It's a tough year. And and she goes to a therapist. We spend well over a thousand dollars a month on her therapy. And it is extreme privilege that I am able to do that. That I have found someone that she can see in person. And, and we have to pay out of pocket for that. That is not something that everyone can do. And frankly, it's not something that everyone can do to find the time to take their child to therapy because that is also quite difficult. Right. I'm not going to say she's not deserving. She is deserving, but she also has a lot of support at home. But, but we do not make it available to everyone who needs it. Right. So let's talk about your record on mental health. And you want to talk about it now? That's a good time. Let's let's actually pass some legislation and make this easier right now, right now. Well. And, and they've done worse than that. They've actually put bills forward to take it away from yes, kids. When you exactly. talk about trans kids, they're actually banning mental health care from trans kids. So you can't say you care about mental health care when you're actually taking it away from some kids. But I think we've also seen such a lack of big moves, right? Like you were talking about big moves from president, Dems, Republicans. Like we just don't see a lot of the big moves that we as Americans really want to see. And I think some of us are left, or at least I am thinking like, what can you do? It feels like you can't do any of this right. when it comes to either shootings, assault rifles, or in like for, even for me. So we uh, did a live with uh, Joe and Jill and we talked about the debt ceiling. Why do we have a debt ceiling? No other country has this. And the only thing a debt ceiling does is cause a bunch of chaos and Republicans use it to get what they want to really otherize a lot of people and take away a lot of things like food stamps from people that they have already othered and said they are not human enough to deserve food to live. The debt ceiling is something that we could do away with that I think the president could do away with. I think he could, but I feel like there's a lot that he probably could do. And we are at the point where can he? Can he do that? I haven't seen a president do anything like that. I'm at the point of just do it and and I ask for uh, forgiveness, not permission at this point. Like that's where I am. pretend you're Clarence Thomas. Oh, like I know the Republicans do it all the time. And like at this point, the Republicans not only do this type of stuff and they do it in an incredibly corrupt way. But then you also have the Republicans do it as they're threatening to take down the entire country. They're threatening civil wars. Yes. They're literally threatening with this debt ceiling to tank our entire economy and throw us into a recession. 
just to get what they want. And it's all connected, right? I think that we like to think of these things in silos, but it's all connected. And we've Mm kind of talked about that connectedness a little bit. We're not, we're doing things backwards. We're not investing in the right places. Mm -hmm. We are giving unfettered access to things that shouldn't be given unfettered access to while completely trying to take access away from things that are actually needed or make it harder for people to get the things that they need. And what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? You make it easier to get a gun than you make it to get food or childcare or a job or transportation or whatever people need just to feel like they can get through life. They don't have a thousand dollars for therapy, but they got six hundred dollars for a thousand dollars a month for therapy, but they got six hundred dollars for a gun. I think that's a good point. I feel like the Republican platform, like I feel like a lot of moms and a lot of parents are like, holy cow, we don't have the resources in this country that I need as a parent. Help. And I feel like the Republicans like, oh, let me parent for you, mm-hmm. right? Let me make decisions for you as a parent. And how's that help? And we're like, no. That's not I what want we you for. to help. Yes. No, no. I need you to help support me so that I can be a great caregiver mm-hmm. and that I can be a great parent. And that is what they have a hard time with is how do we support the caregiver so that they can have the freedom to make the choices they want as parents. They want to make the choices for us as parents. And I think that's a, actually really a good time for us to bring on our troublemaker of the day. Katie Paris is the founder of Red Wine and Blue, and she's here to tell us about the freedom to parent 21st century kids. Katie. Hi, Katie. Thanks for joining us. It's been a little while since we've had you on the pod. So how are you? I mean, just missing you guys every day out there causing trouble. <laughs> when Wondering when I'm going to get back on the suburban women problem. <laughs> For real, you guys, it's so good to see you. I listen every single week and I just thank you. You guys listen so well to what you're hearing out there from other moms and women. And I hear all the time, um, you know, out here in the States talking to women, how they are listening and how much it means to folks to hear conversations or sharing the podcast to help other women understand issues that you guys are tackling and just really appreciate how you break things down and talk about it like in language people actually use to talk about issues, you know, rather than over people's heads. And so appreciate everything you're doing. Oh, who wouldn't love us? I mean, except for every Republican, <laughs> but other than that. The people who see us as a quote problem. That's right. <laughs> All right. So as you know, we talk a lot on the pod about these so-called parents' rights groups. And your new Freedom to Parent initiative is all about mainstream moms calling BS. So could you tell us more about the Freedom to Parent? Okay. This parents' rights thing, you guys, it's completely out of control. It is. It is causing chaos all across the country. I know that you all see it because you don't live in places like Washington, D.C. You are in Ohio, you're in Georgia, you're in Florida, and you are seeing the chaos that this is wreaking in our communities, the problems it is causing for our children who are stressed out enough, and so are we as parents. They think, these extremist politicians think they have their golden ticket with parents' rights, okay? So it doesn't matter whether they are talking about trying to limit what our kids can read and learn. It doesn't matter if they are talking about refusing to do anything to keep our kids safe from guns. It's the exact same people talking about parents' rights. I want to know about my right to be able to send my kid to school knowing they're actually going to be safe. Even They're even doing this on reproductive rights now. They think it's their golden ticket. They they say somehow if we give people reproductive freedom that you know that's going to undermine my parental rights to be able to make decisions with my daughter. Well, guess what? There won't be any decisions available to your daughter if you all get away with taking away our rights, our freedoms as parents who are really trying hard out here. These are complicated times. These are complex times. And what we need is to be supporting each other in navigating this complicated terrain. And what we need is our freedom, Mm -hmm. our freedom for all parents, not just some parents to say, my rights, my rights get to trump everybody else. And my decision should be the same as for everyone else. Every parent in these complicated times needs the freedom to decide what's best for their kid to ensure the safety of their children and to make sure they can get set up for success, to be prepared for the 21st century, to be prepared for a diverse and changing world. And we know that this is how mainstream parents feel. And we know that they're sick and tired of hearing this so-called parents' rights idea being paraded around as though it represents all parents. And, And so we are giving voice to those mainstream parents who've had enough who see the effects of this 
and they're not going to be silent anymore. So we're declaring our freedom to parrot for uh, our 21st century kids. Here, here. We have done it before. I think that we need our political leaders to do share our values, to grow some spine yeah. here, to speak up, to not be like, oh, they're talking about parents' rights. So that must mean we don't want to ruffle the feathers of parents. I'm like, what? Parents, we're over here. Yeah, exactly. Can you please speak up for us? But you know what? Jasmine, you're an exception. But in general, I believe the politicians, they don't lead very often. They follow. So we have got to show the way. Oh, right? Katie, you're going to love this episode. You're going to love the first part of this episode. Oh, it's I like know. you were Yay. listening in. Yeah. Yeah. We want leaders to lead. Shocking. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, this is the thing. You weren't listening, but these are not ideas that exist in a vacuum. These are actually popular ideas. And we're telling people what we need to do. Exactly. And, you know, we, we talk about on the podcast, you know, for some reason, politicians have not been talking about this, or they don't know how to talk about this. Kimberly Crenshaw even recently said, this isn't even a culture war, it's a drive by and the other side isn't fighting at all. Mm, that hits hard. Why do you think they're not talking about it? We know that they need to, but why are they not? They want to talk about the issues that they always have. They feel like that's safe political terrain. And hey, I'm not here to tell you that Social Security and Medicare are not super important. Keep talking about that. But you also got to talk about the things that are showing up in our day-to-day lives. And we are here. We are here. We are here. <laughs> we are here. We are here. Exactly. But you know what? So, but we have seen there, there's a pattern here, right? Like it was not much more than a year ago when we couldn't get pretty much any of our leaders at a state or national level to talk about this whole rampant book banning that's going on mm-hmm. all across the mm-hmm. country. Well, President Biden talked about book bans when he announced his reelection campaign yep. for president a couple weeks ago. I was like, oh, OK, so we have made some progress here. So, you know, we do. You could say the same thing on reproductive rights. There weren't that many politicians who support our freedoms who are like talking about it that much, though. Then Dobbs happened, Roe v. Wade gets overturned, and the people erupt and they follow because they do want to meet that zeitgeist moment. But I think because they often, because of their life circumstances, because of where they live, they are disconnected from the realities on the ground. So we just have to get louder. We have to make it impossible to ignore. So that's what this Freedom to Parent campaign is. We're going to be providing parents who join us with a whole lot of resources, we're recognizing that this is complex terrain. And a lot of these issues are new. I mean, when I was coming up through school, we weren't talking about a lot of this stuff. It doesn't mean it wasn't there, but it, Mm -hmm. you know, things have changed and I need, I need better language. I need to be talking to other moms who are asking questions in a safe space to, you know, ask questions that I can feel not judged. So we're going to be providing that for people. We're going to be having all kinds of virtual events and even in-person events where people can create, we can have those safe spaces. People can ask questions. We are going to be having our band book club meetings and our little band book club we're launching so that parents with school age kids can have a place to talk about some of these books that are getting banned for younger kids. We are going to be launching band bookmobiles this summer, y'all. It's going to be great into these communities where the book bands are coming. We're going to be, you know, lovingly bringing those books into those communities. So people are going to have those conversations. And we're just going to be providing a lot of education and resources who for people who are understandably confused by what is going on on all these issues. We're going to provide a lot of information through, you know, interactive events, as well as just information on our website, people can find to get some answers to questions and then connect with our community. Because you know, that's what we're all about at the end of the day, being there for each other. I love that. I love that y'all have like this great game plan and it's multifaceted and it uh, really covers a lot of bases. I also will say, along with being a legislator, I'm also a mom and you're also a mom, Katie, as well. And so I just wonder, how do your own personal experiences with your own kids inspire this work? You know, one of the women I worked with has this line and I just love it so much. She goes, you know, you think I'm scared? You want to mess with me? Try me. I'm somebody's mom. (laughs) Mama bears coming out. (laughs) Yes. And when you think about like, oh, well, the politicians won't lead on this. I guess we'll have to. It's like, like we, how are we not going to, you know, try to stop me from standing up for my kids. So y'all know I have young kids. And when I think about the future that I want them to be prepared for, and when I think about the expectation that I want them to be safe in school, and I'm talking about whether that is safe from weapons of war 
making it into our classrooms. I am talking about when it comes down to understanding the world around them, that not everyone is the same as them. They're not going to be prepared for this really complex world that we live in. If I can't count on having our teachers be my partners in you know, providing for my kids that preparation for this diverse, changing 21st century global economy world, you know, Mm -hmm. because the real world isn't going to stop being real. I don't want them to be shocked. So we need to be in this together, making sure that they can be as safe as possible, you know, at at, um, every phase of their life. I love that. All right, Katie, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We always love having you. Oh, it was so good to be with you. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Katie. So good to be with you. All right. Bye. Love you. You know, I remember I was very, very blessed to have parents and grandparents who, whether they said it explicitly, I I knew no matter what, there was nothing that I could do that would make them not love me. Right. And I always had that security. But sometimes I feel when Ellie talks about marginalized groups, she will ask me, how I feel about things. And sometimes I think it's like this little test of like, what if I were different? What if I were this? What if I were that? Because I never did things like that, but it wasn't really a conversation. Like we didn't like much more Katie was saying, like we didn't have these conversations when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. When we take out like, let's say DEI from schools. And we've talked a lot about that lately. We are taking away from our children an opportunity to understand their selves, maybe themselves, to understand others and to gain confidence that they can be around other people and accept them. And all those are really important developmental steps. And to take that away, like Katie said, really puts them at a disadvantage for a 21st century society. I can't imagine, even if you weren't different the way your parent was talking about someone else, if you hear your parent othering someone, right? Whether it's trans, whether it's someone who's a different race or an immigrant, that even if you're not that thing, you still can't help but wonder, like, what would that thing have to be for me to where my parent would view me that way? Yes. And if you take that away from schools, then that leaves them with very few places where they feel they belong and they are okay, even if they're different for whatever that difference is. And it can lead to a really dangerous situation for some kids. And even like the book bans can also lead to very dangerous situations to where it might be the only space that some kids even know what they're experiencing is abuse. Yeah because Mm -hmm. they've been taught it's love or something else. And so even the very thing that they say that they're supposedly protecting children, you know, from pedophiles, they actually leave kids more vulnerable to all of that, right? If you don't want your kid to read it, that's very different. But if you're taking it away from everyone's kid, now you are stepping on my toes as a parent. I think it's interesting that you brought up conversations because sometimes parents use books to start conversations. I do all the time. The same way movies start conversations. Mm -hmm. Me and Jada sometimes sit down and watch movies and I don't always watch the movie first before she watches it. So sometimes we're sitting in the movie and maybe there's a scene that might be uncomfortable or it might be something she doesn't quite understand, but it starts a conversation. When you start to take access to information, you start to take away access to conversation. A hundred percent. I always use books when I'm like, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm going to go find a book. <laughs> or I, and I ask people, I ask for people on Twitter and Facebook all the time, like, Hey, tell me a book like this. So I did it recently with, um, so I know there are a lot, you know, kids or kids are going to interact with people that are different than them. a lot of them are like neurodiverse kids. So they might have ADD, ADHD, or any type of sensory issue. And I just didn't know how to have that conversation because I have not had that conversation. I don't quite understand that. So I was asking like, Hey, what are some children's books that could start that conversation and, you know, help my kids explain what that might be like to be in someone else's shoes and how they can understand that. And also how they can, you know, help if they need help and be more empathetic as human beings. (laughs) And 
isn't that the goal of whether you're talking about someone who has a differently wired brain, someone of a different race, someone who is, you know, an immigrant to under, to put yourself as much as you can try to, in their shoes to understand who they are. Like that is what we want for our kids Mm -hmm. and books do that. And every parent should have that option to give that to their kids. All right. So now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have my interview with Chastin, which is totally on subject of what we're talking about right now. Mother's Day is right around the corner. And what better way to celebrate than by spending an evening with rock star mom and historian Heather Cox Richardson. You've probably heard us talking about our 100th episode celebration for a few weeks, but now it's almost here and you only have a few days left to buy tickets. Our special live episode event is coming up on Monday, May 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we can't wait to see you there. You can find more info and claim your ticket by clicking the link in the show notes. Our guest today is one of our favorite people. He's a dad, a teacher, an advocate, and the husband of a former presidential candidate. He's also the author of a memoir called I Have Something to Tell You, which was just adapted into a young adult edition. Chastin Buttigieg, I'm so excited to welcome you back to The Suburban Women Problem. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. So we've been talking on the podcast lately about how we're just about to reach 100 episodes. I can't believe it. Um, And we're doing a live event to celebrate with Heather Cox Richardson, who was our first guest. But you were actually our second guest. (laughs) I talked to you back in May of 2021. And that was actually the first interview that I ever did on the podcast. Wow. So it's so nice to have you back. Well, it's great to be back. So, so much has changed since we talked in May of 21. Uh, We were still deep in the pandemic. Uh, Since then, I've been reelected. We've also seen bills that attack LGBTQ kids sweeping the country. And most importantly of all, you have become a parent. (laughs) And that is true. How have you been for the last two years? How's it been for you? It's been a wild, wild ride. Uh, I, you know, I started writing this book over two years ago, and then the kids were born, so threw a little wrench in there. The kids do that sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> keeping me very, very busy. Um, and they're just remarkable. They're they're so cool. They're like my favorite people in the world. I want to be around them all the time. I just, uh, you know, never like you're you wear your heart on the outside of your chest, you know. Obviously, DC is like a whole nother thing, um, you know, political life, but dad life is just incredible. I I love it so much. So you just released a new version of your memoir for young adults. Yeah. And unfortunately, things have not gotten better for gay and trans kids in this country in the past two years. It just seems like if things could get worse, they just keep getting worse. Yeah. So could you tell our listeners more about your memoir and why you decided to adapt it to younger readers? Yeah. So my the the goal of the book was to write something I wish I could have read when I was in middle school. It's also a book I really wish my teachers and my parents could have had. Um, so they would have known the pain I was going through as a closeted gay teen in rural northern conservative Michigan you know, what I really needed, uh, the allyship, the love I needed, the support I needed, and what that could have done for my confidence. So I, you know, I detail a lot of those stories growing up and then go into teaching and obviously the presidential campaign a little bit. But this one is really for young people. And this is my way of helping them believe that it still can get better. I believe we're in this season of politics because things were actually getting better. And now because things were getting better, Certain people are scared by that, so they want to make it worse. Yeah, it's like a reaction, and it's really unfortunate. Um, So I would love to hear one of the stories that you tell in your book. Oh, sure. You know, there's so much in there about conforming and identity and masculinity and politics and bullying. And there's some hard stuff in there, you know, like heartbreaking stuff. I wanted to share like a really vulnerable side of myself with the young readers so they could, you know, sense what I went through. But then there's also some humor in there as well. So there's this whole chapter I love about 
not blending in on the playground and not knowing like who my friends were. And I wasn't good at track and I wasn't good at basketball and I wasn't, you know, good at all these like athletic things. And um, it, it just kind of details like my parents setting me up for, you know, the next thing, like join the basketball team. And like, I failed miserably, like join the track and field team. And I failed miserably. And then there's a, there's a good chunk in there about growing up in 4-H and what, what it was like, you know, raising cows and the chapter's called, I am not a cowboy. <laughs> and, you know, this frightened, weird, lonely, you know, closeted kid who's like wearing Wrangler jeans and like American flag shirts with the Stetson showing steers at the county fair, like, you know, what I really want to be doing is like singing Celine Dion on stage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot in there just about like identity and like what I thought everyone wanted me to be versus like what I, you know, allowed myself to believe. And ultimately when I leaned into my differences, how I, you know, flourished and grew to love myself. I love that. All right. So I think most of our listeners already support LGBTQ kids, Mm -hmm. but they're out there having conversations with their friends and neighbors about some of these issues. So for our listeners, do you have any advice about how they can talk to people in their lives about all these anti-trans and anti-gay bills? Because it's a lot. And I I think people are just kind of like, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I think especially when it comes to trans Americans, if it's something that's really new to you, one of the most helpful things that you can do is to pause and then do your research. When I was traveling the country a couple of years ago on the campaign, I felt an expectation to speak up for everyone, not only speak up for everyone in our community, but to represent everyone in our community. And as a you know white cisgender gay man, I walk through the world with different privileges than other people. I also have no idea what it's like to be trans. So for me, it was really important to sit down and learn from you know young trans people, learn what was going on uh, in the community, and learn how I could be a better ally. And there's a lot of information that I didn't have, and I had to go seek it out. There were connections that I needed to make, research I needed to do, and I needed to approach that with empathy. And because I believed in sticking up for people in our community, I wanted to do that work first. And so I think right now, something that folks can do is just take a breath and do some research. The greater America, the wider American medical community supports gender affirming care. It is life saving care. I would recommend people look to the science and the professionals in medicine, in mental health, in education, and learn before they react. There are also pockets of this country, especially in rural America, that don't have PFLAG chapters. So, you know, you could start your own PFLAG chapter and join like-minded and similar parents uh, who can, you know, come together and meet and, and share that community, but also, you know, the same purpose. Uh, for for sticking up for their for their kids, but I think it's a season of active allyship right now. That the allyship has to be more than just posting on social media. I love that. So one theme in your memoir is authenticity, mm-hmm. and you know having the courage to be our true self no matter what. And so obviously that's like a super important message for young adults, but honestly, it's really important for all of us. Yeah. Uh, What lessons did you learn about authenticity in your formative years that have continued to be important to you even today as an adult? Well, like I write in the book, I felt like being authentic uh, was viewed as a sign of weakness. I thought that I was growing up in an environment that actually preferred that young men only look and act and behave in a very certain way it didn't feel like there was a lot of room for stepping outside of the norm. It didn't feel like it was cool to be creative or, you know, funny. And it's sometimes I wondered whether I was being laughed with or laughed at because I was like the young theatrical geek, you know, um, I was like on the bowling team and in theater and in 4-H and I, you know, didn't conform to a lot of the norms. And when I grew up, especially when I was, out on the presidential campaign trail, I realized that all of these things that I had either grown up learning or something like to hide from other people, or I just like, you know, felt internally that I shouldn't discuss. I found the more that I shared those with other people, the more people felt a connection to me, the more people saw themselves in me or in my story. Uh, 
And so I feel like the more vulnerable we are, the more we allow other people to connect with us. And so that's why I started opening up about the internalized homophobia I felt, my coming out story, the wonderful story of like reconnecting with my parents after I ran away from home and like the power of that love and the goodness that could come from it, student debt. Um, And certainly like in the adult version of the book, I talked about my experience with, you know, dating and sexual assault and why it's really important to share those stories if you're able so that other people can feel less alone. So because I felt like I suppressed so much of my identity for so long and then like leaned into it, I saw how much good could come out of living a more open and vulnerable, but authentic life because other people could see themselves in it too. I I love all of that. I love that you mentioned people being able to see themselves because I think a lot of times, especially when people are just trying to figure life out, they are they often feel alone. Yeah. <laughs> like they feel like they're the only one that's really yes. going through this and they wonder how everyone else seems to have it all together and they're like, you know, not understanding everything and they don't have everything put together. Um and so we talk a lot about book bans yeah. on this uh, on our show uh, because that is something that is happening across the country, and in particular, we talk a lot about how banning books does take away the ability for someone to maybe see themselves in a character yeah. in a book. And so, I'm curious: um, Do you have any concerns that? your book could or would be banned by some of these, you know, crazies out here that are kind of just free for all in it when it comes to um, banning books that do deal with some of the issues that you probably talk about. Yeah. I mean, I'm under no illusion of, you know, what we're dealing with here. And I certainly didn't think that this would be the, you know, national landscape when I started writing the book two years ago. I also think it would just be politics if my book were banned. You know, I wrote a completely age appropriate book. Um, I used to be a teacher. I, I I knew my audience. I used to teach middle school. Um, So I think if it, it, if it is banned, then it's just politics because then it's just, you know, silencing the voice of gay authors um, or just the existence of a story about a gay person is the thing that they're really upset about. And I, I also will just say like, as a parent, as a teacher, I would never put my kids in a position where they would be, you know, confronted with something age inappropriate as an author, as a teacher, as a parent, I would never write something I think is age inappropriate. And I think the conversation about like parents' rights and what's appropriate for kids is sort of being weaponized to make it sound like there's a problem that exists when it really doesn't. Yeah. Because this, you know, they, they threw everything at the wall and they saw what, what's stuck and what's, you know, what's sticking is LGBTQ people again. Yeah. And so they infuse a lot of fear and confusion into something that, you know, isn't happening right now. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think a lot of it is just um, they had to choose their boogeyman of the year. And that ended up being LGBTQ children of all people and so many of the things that they're doing. Um, But, you know, to your point, um, your book is going to be, you know, it's just telling your story to an audience in an age appropriate manner. However, I've seen people try to ban books about um, two penguins that happen to be the same sex raising an egg. So I feel like if people want to be outraged, they can find anything to be outraged about. And that's really unfortunate because the people who suffer the most are the people who just want to learn or the people who want to see themselves in a character or maybe the kid that's still trying to figure life out. And, you know, they're maybe they resonate with some of the stories that you tell in your memoir. Books like, you know, books like the Penguin book, that's just like erasing the existence of LGBTQ families. Exactly. Right. Or just different families. Like some people have, you know, two dads, some people have two moms, some people live with their grandma, you know, some people have a solo parent, some people live with four different adults, you know, on a rotating basis, like all families look different. And so that one is really silly to me because it's just erasing the existence of, you know, same sex, um, same sex couple. The thing about the bands that is so silly to me is like, they say it's not about, it's not about gay people, you know, it's just about age appropriate content, but I don't know about you, but when I was in middle school, I read this story about like a 14 and 15, like 
two teenagers, 14, 15 years old, who fell in love with one another in <laughs> one day, got married, uh, may or may not have consummated that marriage off stage, and then <laughs> killed themselves out of love. Do you right. remember Romeo yes. and Juliet? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we all had to read that. Yes. <laughs> Nobody was out in the streets protesting, you know, that story that was completely age appropriate for us to learn amongst a litany of other stories, also because we trusted parents and we trusted teachers to make educated decisions and to teach content that they thought was appropriate to children uh, and to be able to have the conversations around that kind of content. Now you see the introduction of more stories, including LGBTQ characters, characters of color, and that bothers them. And the question is, why does it? Yeah. Why now? Like why yeah. out of all the things, why is this so concerning to you. And like you said, we literally read about teen suicide yeah. when we were younger. Right. And, and when they say that it's not, you know, it's not about the existence of gay people, it's just age appropriate content. I call bologna sandwiches because we read um, many things when we were kids, you know, Lord of the Flies. Yes. Um, and nobody had a problem with that. So if they want to re-examine literature, then there's going to be a lot of stories with straight characters that would you know, based on the rules that they, you know, are are putting out that would need to be, you know, revoked as well. Agree. Well, all right. It's been such a joy to have you back on the pod. So as you probably remember from before, you know, we like to ask our guests a few rapid fire questions before we go. Okay. So you ready? All right. Alrighty. Here we go. <laughs> Uh-oh. All right. Okay. So the last time you were on the pod, we talked about how excited you were for Broadway to open back up. So what's been your favorite Broadway show of the past two years? Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, I got to take my parents to Wicked when it came through the Kennedy Center at Christmas time. I saw Wicked, too. And my dad had never seen a musical in his life. And it was just incredible to share that with him. I love that theater is reopening. I just saw Ben Platt in Parade, which was incredible. Um, Sean Hayes and Goodnight Oscar was incredible. Um, yeah. I love it. Wicked actually was the first Broadway show that I ever saw. After you and I talked, I actually got a chance to go it's great. to New York and Wicked was what I saw. Lovely. So next question, what is your go-to Starbucks order? Ooh, I'm all over the place. Uh, usually, usually I'm just like an iced coffee with a dash of cream kind of person. Um, every now and then I like green tea latte. I love it. I'm a green tea person. So I just learned how much sugar is in the coffee frappuccino though. I used to be like, I don't get any of the sugary ones. <laughs> I just get the plain coffee frappuccino that thing's got like 40 grams of sugar in it. I didn't know yes. all this, all this time. Uh, but normally I'm just a <laughs> ice, co ice coffee all year round. I like it. All right. So what's been the best part about becoming a dad? Oh man. They have this incredible way of reminding you how beautiful the world is. Like Gus is obsessed with birds right now. And this morning I was getting him out of the stroller and putting him in his car seat. And he was like, he stopped and he was looking around. Um, there are like birds in the trees, like birds on the pavement, birds in the bushes. And he's just like, bird, bird, bird. And like the wonder in his eyes and it's every day, right? They're just fascinated by the world to point out all the fire trucks and the buses and the trucks. And when the world just seems so overwhelming, I love pausing and trying to be very present with them because they really pull you back down to earth very quickly. I love that. You know, because they're just enjoying the existence of birds, you know, yeah. when you're like wrapped up in what's happening online or in politics. I love that. I know. I miss that. My kids are teenagers now, so they are not as excited to see birds, but you know, <laughs> they, they, it's still, it's a, a whole different adventure, but I totally know what you mean when they, yeah. when they're just discovering the world and the things that you pass right by, they're like, that thing is amazing. Yeah. And you're like, actually, you know, you're right. It yeah. is kind of amazing. We can walk around the neighborhood and it'll take like an hour because we have to stop <laughs> you know, everything and look at it and inspect it. It's so and cool. And look at every little flower, dandelion. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah. All right. So some pretty amazing people have praised your memoir. Who were you the most starstruck to get a quote from about your book? Oh, man. I mean, obviously very grateful that so many people had nice things to say about the book. Growing up, I didn't really know a lot of gay people. And then Ellen DeGeneres came on TV and... Ellen was sort of like a hint to me that it could be possible because my mom really liked watching her show and she laughed at it and like, maybe, you know, things will get better. And so the fact that like I grew up and wrote a story in which, you know, Ellen appreciated and 
you know, wanted to blurb was, was really touching. I love that. Awesome. All right. So last question. This is kind of a hard one, but I think a good one. What gives you hope? Oh, well, my kids, um, because I know what I'm, I know what my mission is. I know what I'm working toward. And even when there's dread, there's still hope because I want to leave them a better world. I want to leave them with things that I'm proud of, you know, writing this book, it gave me so much purpose to leave something behind that hopefully they'll be proud of one day. And the fact that there are really good people out there doing good work. And so when you're overwhelmed with social media and it just seems like everything is dreadful, just remember that there are so many good people out there who aren't getting the attention they deserve. Right. And I certainly know them here in Washington. You know, no one wants to talk about what they're doing because it's not flashy, but there are so many good people in this world who I know also want those things for my kids too. I love that. All right. So that is the end of our rapid fire questions. You did a great job. Thank you. All right. So where can people go to find out more about you and your book? Thank you. Folks can visit chastenwrites.com and you can order a book there. You can learn a little bit more about it. You can also donate a copy on the website to nonprofit LGBTQ centers. We're going to try to make sure the book gets in the hands of young people uh, who need it the most, as well as teachers and other nonprofit centers. So uh, Chaston writes, W-R-I-T-E-S dot com. I love it. So, so nice talking to you again, Chaston. Thanks for coming back to the Suburban Women Problem. Thanks for having me. I have something to tell you for young adults. Goes on sale May 16th and is available now for pre-order. Tickets for Chaston's in-person national book tour are also available at chastonwrites.com. Welcome back, everyone. Jasmine, I loved your interview with Chaston. Uh, I love that he was saying this is a season for active allyship right now. It has to be more than posting on social media. Oh, yeah. Like, that is it. Like, that is the whole thing to me. Like, we need to be supporting each other. Yes, amplifying each other's voices. Can we come together as a collective, as a team to change what we see in our country right now? Yeah, I think one of the things that like really resonated with me is like kind of the why, because I think a lot of people ask like, why, why are they going after LGBTQ kids mm-hmm. right now? Why are, are they like the the new boogeyman? And it's funny because since we've been doing this podcast, we've talked about the different boogeymen mm-hmm. that have like come up and it's like a recurring theme and it does not fail. Like this is something we did not make that up. It is happening. And one of the things that he talked about was that as a society, especially the younger people, they're becoming more tolerant, more accepting, and things were actually getting better. But I think that when that happened, there were some adults that saw that and said, no, 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 we cannot have you tolerating people Mm -hmm. because we need to maintain our boogeyman. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep something to be scared of. And so we're going to do this and we're going to go all in and try to reverse this trend of tolerance. And I think they're scared that their children might be different, um, Mm -hmm. whether or not they're gay or trans or different in any way, you know, as I think in teaching, you know, you, you see, especially in the very younger grades that parents really just want to make sure their children are fitting in, that they have friends, that they're on track or better than their peers. And and why? Because we know the importance of being quote unquote normal, of being with a group. And if you're different, we know that it makes life harder. So it can come from a place of good, but manifest itself in a really harmful way. Yes. And, and I agree. And, you know, I just, the idea of active allyship, um, next month is as pride month. And, you know, I would like to see a lot of parents joining these marches. I mean, yeah, I I pray that they're safe, but joining these marches, like we did for the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, protest in 2020 to really say like, am I wearing a rainbow shirt? 
am I gay? Is my child gay? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Exactly. Uh, I, That's where we need to get to. I am doing this because I am showing my support for this community. And if it has a personal meaning, great. If it doesn't, great. Yeah. And I think it's how we get to all the other stuff we want to see happen in our country, yeah. right? We cannot keep seeing them, the Republicans wage these culture wars and let that drive the entire narrative and let them say whatever they want. We have to stop it in its tracks and then take the steering wheel away from them. They should not have a political driver's license. Like it's <laughs> time to take that away. Well, I think that's a good time for us to transition to our toast to joy. And so, you know, every week we like to talk about something great or positive that is happening in our lives or in our communities or anything like that. So this week I will start with you, Rachel. What is your toast to joy? My toast to joy this week is my dear friend and former neighbor, She told me, we both, um, actually we both live in Florida now in different areas. And she was my across the street neighbor for several years. And she hasn't really made any friends in her area, but she saw someone online, um, like, I don't know if it was in a neighborhood group or a parents group who was posting similar things to her. And she said, you know what I did, Rachel, you guys talk about on your podcast. We just got together a group of like-minded moms based on, you know, what they've been posting. They found some people, invited them over to her house, and they talked about what they could do and how they could help and, you know, how they could make a difference. And so, I mean, you know, it's the beginning, but it's a step. And she was- I love that. I, I mean, I loved it too. And I, I I was saving it for our Toast of Joy. And I a couple of times I was like, oh, I should text this to them because it's just- Everything always feels like it's really, really heavy, but there's good that's happening out there. And there are people who are getting together and you can do this. You can start this. And, and, you know, my friend is not like this Uber organizer, but she just took that first step and she really did it for her children and to say, how can I make a difference? So my toast to joy is to Lindsay and her friends who are brave, who know they need to step up and create what they want. And they have to lead by example. Politics doesn't have to be talking points and Fox News. It can be real life. Mm -hmm. Politics is is having a drink with your friends. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, So Amanda, what is your toast to joy this week? All right. So my toast to joy. So my daughter did turn six. So happy birthday, Amelia. But she's not going to get my toast to joy. She's getting other things for her birthday. It's fine. (laughs) But my toast to joy is actually we just in the primary for Akron voted in Shamus Malik, who uh, is basically the primaries, the whole deal with Akron. Uh, So he uh, when he becomes mayor will be the first person of color to be mayor of Akron, which is huge oh, wow. for a group to be represented. And he is young and so smart and there is such, and he won by a much wider margin than anyone was predicting. So it was definitely like Akron is ready for a change and we want something new. We want new ideas. So I am very hopeful for, and we also in Cleveland have um, Justin Bibb. So we have elected some like new young people in office that are ready to make big changes for these cities that need big changes. So I'm super excited. So Shamus, who is also a friend, congrats to Shamus. I know that a lot of us are excited. And I love that he also says, you know, in a lot of his speeches, he'll say, you know, this is not elect Shamus and I'm going to change things for you. Right. And I do believe that's true with even Biden. This is not elect Biden. And we sit back and Biden's going to change everything for us. Mm -hmm. We need to work on this together. No one person can do it. We all need to stand up, become a team, work as a collective and get things done. All right, Jasmine, what is your toast to joy? All right. So my toast to joy is to, and you probably can um, uh, relate to this, Amanda, um, the semester being over and all of my grades being turned in. (laughs) Um, Also, I just want to give a shout out to my students without going into any detail. I had a perfect semester. No students will, you know, have to repeat my class uh, because they all passed. So I'm very, very proud of that. I know that that does not happen all the time. So I am actually really excited about that. Amanda's notably silent right now. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) This does not happen all the time. So, uh, it was a good semester. Um, I felt great all semester though. And so, um, I'm really proud of my students and I have been tapped to do a lot more stuff, uh, with our students and getting them 
to the Capitol and making sure that they understand the importance of advocacy. I'm writing a book chapter this summer. Like I'm like really starting to like bridge that health and policy gap. Love it. And so I'm 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 so into it, y'all. Like I'm like, I don't really get excited about a lot of things, but I'm starting to get really excited about the opportunity to do health and policy. So really lead into my nerdiness, but also lead into the fact that I'm in politics and I want more people to really pay attention to what's going on. So that's my toast. Great. I love it. And with that, thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. Don't forget, there are just a few days left to purchase your ticket to our special event with Heather Cox Richardson. We also have some exciting new Suburban Women Problem merch if you're interested in representing your love for the pod. You can find the link in our show notes. We'll see you next week for our 100th episode of The Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, and our project manager is Lindsay Quist. Videos by Abigail Martin and Ashley Hufford. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, Follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.